Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the green space with a Climate Week special today. And remember, folks, you can watch the Brian Lehrer Show when we're in the green space as well as listen. Our live stream is on Twitter or Facebook. Go to the Brian Lehrer Show or Brian Lehrer uh, Twitter and Facebook feeds or the WNYC Facebook page or just go to the WNYC homepage at WNYC.org and you see the links um, for the video stream. So we talk so much about the climate on a global level, but we're sitting here in Soho near the Hudson River, and the two states on either side of that river are also taking action at the state level through policy. But are the policies enough? And to the point of this conversation coming up, do they take environmental justice into account? Do they address the cumulative impacts of climate change on vulnerable communities. Here to talk about some of their recent initiatives to address what they will call the cumulative impacts of climate change on communities of color in New York and New Jersey are Eddie Batista, Executive Director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and Nicole Scott Harris, the Education Coordinator and Organizer for the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Welcome both of you to the green space, Eddie and Nicole. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the uninitiated, Eddie, is this a term that you use, cumulative impact? Yeah, unfortunately, government doesn't, but yeah, that's, that's the term for us. Environmental justice is, you know, we all should know by now, it's the fight of, for low-income communities and communities of color against not only the cumulative environmental burdens that so often get clustered in our communities, but also the lack of equal economic development opportunities, right? So it's, it's uh, but it is at the end of the day about the clustering and, and lack of cumulative analysis of how these exposure and emissions affect our communities. Nicole, you want to pick up on that? Um, yeah, so definitely um, cumulative impacts is about the interplay of different types of socioeconomic and environmental justice factors or environmental uh, factors in general. Um, so you have to think about a person who might be under a certain amount of undue stress because maybe they're lower income, um, maybe they have to work multiple jobs, maybe they have to walk through a neighborhood where the air quality is not um, at the pr appropriate standard on a day-to-day -day basis to go back and forth to work or to pick up their child from school. Their indoor air quality is substandard. And then you think about all the different um, sources that might be in their community that's emitting different type of emissions. Is it possible to list for each of you a couple of top environmental justice uh, specific issue concerns. I'm, I'm curious to, you know, first of all, let the, the audience hear beyond an abstraction what kinds of things you're really dealing with on the ground. And also, I'm curious to compare New York and New Jersey and see if they're basically the same or if they're going to vary very much. Eddie, you want to start? Sure. So so for us, it's, it's uh, look at the basic pieces of infrastructure uh, city needs to kind of, or at least while cities have traditionally uh, deployed them, waste transfer stations, highways, uh, um, even the legacy of, uh, of uh, manufacturing past with, with still literally thousands of acres of brownfields, still in, 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 a, in a rapidly gentrifying city, right? Um, you know, ex uh, undue exposure to clusters of power plants and uh, sewage treatment plants. So, and that's just the infrastructure, right? When you, when you talk about, um, you know, some of the private uh, issues that we've got to deal with, whether it's, uh, as, as Nicole mentioned, housing issues or, you know, dealing with um, uh, kind of rampant development and people keep forgetting that, uh, you know, gentrification also has an environmental justice and a climate justice impact to the degree the city's not dealing with it. So over the years, our work continues on kind of traditional environmental uh, clustering problems, uh, but increasingly over the last 10 to 15 years, it's been also about climate change, about, uh, you know, the, the relative resiliency or lack of resiliency of our communities. How do we kind of ramp up mitigation adaptation efforts uh, that we need to, to, because of course we all know, uh, you know, climate change affects everyone, but its impacts are not evenly distributed, right? Uh, so if we, if we accept the premise that low-income communities and communities of color, whether it's here in the United States or the global south, that we're disproportionately vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, that's a whole other level of, of, of work that, that, we, that we're faced with. Nicole, how about you? Top couple of things that your work has been focused on? Um, so I'll talk about... Um, targeting the Port Authority as um, 
as the people who are in charge of the port of Newark and Elizabeth, um, as well as um, all of these bridges and tunnels, one of them um, sort of by state entities that kind of operates in its own terrain in terms of authority, oversight, and transparency to the extent that it exists. Um, the governors of both state don't have um, any particular, so individualized control over it, but can they control it together with an appointed board. Um, and, and so the accountability there is highly problematic, and I bring that up, it's attached to so many different things. So um, Newark and Elizabeth are the largest port, seaports on the East Coast. Um, Newark is one of the busiest airports on the East Coast, which is closest to Manhattan geographically. Um, so both of those entities are operated by the Port Authority. And so we're targeting the Port Authority to try and make sure that they're um, investing and in requiring their tenants, I mean, even though the land in Newark is actually owned by the municipality, they, they have no control, um, make sure that the tenants there, the different um, terminal operators and companies that have truck drivers that come in and out of the port are investing in zero emissions technology, investing in zero, zero emissions vehicles and electrifying the port operations as much as possible, um, redrawing truck routes so that people are not going through cities and forcing things such as truck routes, because sometimes trucks try to circumvent tolls, which are a big thing in New Jersey, um, and also enforcing truck um, idling, which is also a major thing in New Jersey. And all of this stuff is buttressed against the Passaic River, which is the largest Superfund site in the country. Um, so all of this is, you know, kind of laying the the terrain for what exactly is happening in Newark, this extremely lucrative entity um, on top of that, we can talk about Amazon and, and the race to the bottom that occurred between um, the city of New York and um, various different municipalities, including some stuff here in your own backyard. So we continue to focus on um, the port, the logistics industry in general, and the emissions and different types of ways that it contributes to um, environmental degra degradation, including um, plastics, which was talked about in a previous segment. Mm -hmm. So really, maybe Chris Christie had the right idea, trying to close some lanes on the George Washington uh, Bridge. No. Um, well, how, how, how that, that, <laughs> that, actually, that actually speaks, I think, in, in, in volumes to, to the lack of transparency in, a, in an agency where you're dealing with that amount of money um, and that a chairman um, would be unaware that there are lane closures and one of the busiest bridges um, in the country, so that's is is really absurd when you when you kind of think about it. But and listeners, if you live in any of the neighborhoods most likely to be heavily impacted by environmental issues here in New York and New Jersey, give us a call. How's the quality of your air and water? If you suffer from an ailment, perhaps as a direct result of your living environment and you think it's an environmental justice issue, we want to hear from you. Or you can call us with questions for Nicole and Eddie regarding how you can get involved and find solutions or whatever you want to ask. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. Or if you're here in the green space and you want to tell a story or ask a question, just raise your hand and we'll come around with a microphone. Uh, and again, if you're just joining us, listeners, our guests, for this segment of our Green Space Climate Special are Eddie Bautista, Executive Director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and Nicole Scott Harris, the Education Coordinator and Organizer for the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, there, there was a report released, maybe you're both familiar with it, I don't know, by the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Initiative, and Newark and New York City ranked Similarly, they're both high on the list of cities that were deemed least prepared and most vulnerable for uh, or to climate change hazards. So uh, I, I'm curious um, if you would want to put some specific meat on those bones or say what some of the ways are that the city at the city level uh, of, New, of New York and Newark might be preparing for the changes coming down um, the pike, to use a New Jersey word. But Eddie, you want to start in New York? Uh, yeah, so we, we've been um, monitoring how New York City's uh, uh, 
unveiling and, and deploying its kind of resiliency and adaptation work for the last few years, we uh, produced something called the New York City Climate Justice Agenda, which looks at the de Blasio administration's implementation of 1NYC, which is their kind of rebranded uh, sustainability plan for the city. And we look to see how it matches up in terms of addressing the vulnerabilities of, of our communities. Uh, and, you know, we give credit where credit is due. And then we also, uh, you know, highlight issues where they're falling short, right? So, um, you know, we've got uh, for New York City, uh, a standard of 80 by 50, 80 percent emissions reduction, greenhouse uh, gas emission reductions uh, by 2050. And there is a range of activity that we have to do to hit those targets, which even now people are saying they're not ambitious enough. I mean, the people forget that when New York City adopted that standard, it was um, you know, three days before the People's Climate March. And at the time in 2014, it set the standard for major cities across the world, right? Um, are we on pace to meet those targets? It's questionable, right? Um, you know, we've got a zero waste standard for New York City, and we're, uh, you know, we're, we're only now starting to grapple with the commercial waste sector, which is two thirds of the city's waste stream, right? Um, how do we? How is the city looking at investing to uh, in terms of coastal resiliency, right? Uh, we hear a lot about the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been uh, identified for Lower Manhattan, but meanwhile, we forget the Hunts Point food market which is in the South Bronx, which you know feeds like 23 million people throughout the region. Uh, and we've learned now after Sandy that had Sandy uh, landfall coincided with high tide for the Long Island Sound, that our food distribution system for the region, not just New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, would have been disrupted and nobody knows for how long. And we have yet to see dollar one invested in coastal resiliency for the South Bronx. So we've got a lot of work to do. Everybody should go on a road trip and see Hunts Point and that waterfront. That would be an interesting thing for uh, New Yorkers from everywhere to do. How about Newark? Nicole, I know your office is based there. Yes, so um, I work uh, out of Newark and um, one of the things that sort of perplexes me is about this um, obsession and fascination with development on the waterfront. Um, <laughs> which um, Newark was classified as like in you know, the top 10 of the quote unquote opportunity zones. And um, if you look at the um, listing of the places that were classified in the top 10 opportunity zones, a lot of it is concentrated around waterfront, um, which kind of, it really, it really, really um, baffles me. And when you're dealing with a city that uh, Newark has, you know, a very rich history, uh, Lots of renowned people um, come from the state of New Jersey and the city of Newark specifically, um, and, and, and has all different kinds of assets, resources, including the people, which are its most valuable resource. Um, and and I, I just do not get this, um, this impetus to accommodate development that's that's contrary to common sense. I guess it's just people want to live near the water because it's nice, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's nice to have peace of mind. Um, <laughs> you know, it's right. nice to have low homeowners insurance, or um, you know, it's, it's, to me, that's that's what I think of as nice. And and so in Newark, I, I say that because there's this economic revitalization that is happening, um, and a lot of things that are being developed and projects that are happening, and in, in sort of the environment is in the is in the background, um, and it's and it's, it's a it's a retroactive planning as opposed to putting the environment at the center of the planning, which is, is kind of some of the objectives of some of the cumulative impact policy work that we've done in New Jersey. How much do you see this as sort of um, a conflict of competing goods, both of which you want? Uh, I'm thinking about the case of Amazon in Long Island City, for example, where certainly people want jobs, um, they, you know, they want uh, the possibility for economic advancement in that respect, but we know all the downsides of Amazon that wound up getting the, the plan canceled um, because of the activism of people who didn't want gentrification, people who didn't want to support their relationship with ICE, their production of plastic packaging and shipping and all of that stuff. Um, and yet, at the same time, just to keep going around in circles, you know, people want the economic development. So how do you experience that in, in Newark, that conflict, that tension between two things you want that sometimes it seems like they can't co coexist? 
Well, I mean, the economic development is act obviously winning. I mean, um, if we're losing as a result of it, it's yet to be determined. But the economic development is winning. It, it, it continues to win. Um, and we just keep uh, ringing the alarm and continue to engage with the uh, city administration to continue to engage with the, the state administration on uh, ways. And, and also, we engage directly with the Port Authority's Port Division. Um, and in the past, uh, the region, um, region two of the EPA, um, continuing to engage them on these conversations and the sense of urgency and necessity to um, take bold action. But, you know, after Long Island City, Nork was still soliciting Amazon to come to Nork. Come to Nork. I went to a panel um, for the League of Municipalities last fall for the state of New Jersey, and it was uh, the same week or within the week since Amazon had announced its two locations for a second and third headquarters. And it was a panel of municipal or municipal representatives um, talking about their uh, submission to the Amazon contest. And, and there was no um, hindsight or um, retrospective on the fact that we were giving away the bag, like $7 billion. Right, like, and, and that wasn't even a, a factor in them making decision for the location where they went. And so I was waiting for somebody on the panel to say, oh, well, at least we know next time we don't have to give away the whole bag in order to get something, that we really need to play from a position of our strength and recognize our various different um, assets and, and resources and so that we're playing hardball and not, you know, rolling out the red carpet for this entity that at the end of the day is not going to really meaningfully change the lives of the average North resident. We invited callers to call in with environmental justice stories or questions, and we have a few. So let's go to line two, Pamela in Queens. Pamela, you're on WNYC. Hello there. Um, thank you. Two quick things. One is um, I was working in a uh, South Bronx in a school complex recently in Mott Haven, um, four schools and students with disabilities built on a toxic waste site from a factory. Um, and the monitoring that they're supposed to be doing of the air quality in there for the system that's supposed to keep the fumes from coming up, those, that monitoring was not being done at least for the two years prior to when I was working there. And Nobody's informed, not the, not the staff, not the students, not the parents. Nobody has information about this. People are just going and they don't really know what they're being exposed to or not um, because they're also not doing the monitoring. Um, and I personally live in Queens and you actually I think I had a segment about this before, but like, like three blocks from, like, couple, like three doors down from where I live, there's a house, single family house going for a normal price 10 years ago. It's going for $1.7 million. Anybody for the neighborhood could not possibly get in there to buy that. It's definitely going to be knocked down for a developer to put up something that isn't necessarily necessary, but there will be all kinds of waste and materials and then, you know, and it forces people to have to move and not the whole other emissions event that probably nobody's mm -hmm. tracking. So those are things just in my space. Th thank you. Um, thank you for both. Mm -hmm. pa Pamela, thank you for both of those things. So Eddie Batista as the New York activist here. First of all, um, what can people do if they're, you know, now going to that site uh, in the Bronx and they don't know if it's hazardous? Well, what's interesting is that even the pathetic monitoring that they're doing or not doing now happened as a result of organizing and litigation. So uh, South Bronx environmental justice activists sued, I think this was like 10 years ago, when, uh, when that school was being cited. And the fact that there's even the, the monitoring system that's in place was as a result of settlement uh, talks, right, in, in litigation. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a real problem. I mean, I think, you know, as we're running out of space in the city, um, you know, we're going to continue to build, uh, and we're going to build on places that, you know, are going to be challenging, like brownfields, right? I mean, Nicole's point is right. Like, you know, we, you know, the, what's that definition of insanity? Doing things a hundred times and on the hundred and first time, expecting a different outcome. I mean, if, if we're if we're serious as a society about having to do things differently because climate change demands it, 
that sense of urgency is, you know, it's funny, at times you see fits and starts, like for example, this last um, session in Albany, we managed to pass, after five years of, of, of pushing, the, a coalition called New York Renews uh, got something called the Climate and Community Protection Act passed. It was changed by in, in negotiations with the Cuomo administration. They inserted the word leadership there. That's that's another topic. But um, well, I was going to ask yeah. you about this because we did some coverage of this at at the time when the legislature was in session earlier in the year. Right. Uh, the governor calls it a Green New Deal bill. And it does have some of the strictest time limits of any state in the country for right. serious emission reductions, right? right. right. I mean, so that's a bill. That, and by the way, I, I do have to say something about a Green New Deal. There's nothing new about a Green New Deal, right? I, I, we need to be cognizant that the frame of Green New Deal is pretty much a just transitions frame. It's a frame that was pioneered and implemented by environmental justice activists across the country. Um, we have been pursuing that in different parts of, uh, and it's basically this notion of as we transition from a fossil fuel based extractive economy uh, to one that's a uh, clean regenerative economy, we have to make sure that we're doing it in a way that centers both the frontline communities, the most disproportionately vulnerable, but the workers that are being left behind, or even some of the tax bases. Like in New York State, for example, uh, people forget, like if we close some of these power plants upstate, the people that are gonna get hurt the most in some of the upstate towns are not the workers in the fossil fuel uh, power plant, it's the teachers in the local school whose tax base depends on that power plant, right? So the notion of, of just, that's what the Climate and Community Protection Act attempted to do, which was to challenge New York State to pass the most ambitious climate change law among the 50 states. And if you saw some of the coverage, it's actually even globally, it's, it's it, it, you know, it's kind of, and it's economy wide, right? So. We, pa we they passed the assembly three years out of the last four, and it stalled in the Senate, even though we had a majority of the Senate uh, sponsors, because the Republican leadership and the IDC never let independent Democratic caucus, didn't allow that bill to come to a vote. Last summer, last year, you had the sea change of uh, progressive politics, then that energy that we keep talking about, this urgency that people are feeling, drove out the six uh, Democrats that were caucusing with the Republicans. And lo and behold, you got rent regulations passed, you got the climate law passed. And so that's an example of how legislatively this notion of just transitions and doing things differently, we have to force that. But government. you feel just because of all the good press that that bill got for its um, emissions limits, you still feel it's not a strong bill in terms of climate justice, correct? <laughs> Well, so, so one of the things that they did was, so we had uh, in the bill, it called for directing 40% of the state's clean energy funds to, again, frontline communities, the most disproportionately uh, impacted. Of course, if you look at where the, the bulk of the infrastructure that's creating the climate change impacts of, in New York State, you can only cite those in manufacturing zones, right? So who do you think lives and works in manufacturing zones, right? So what they did was they changed the language of the bill from direct funding to 35% of the state uh, frontline communities would benefit from, what, what, what does that mean, benefit? We had direct funding. You could argue well, that mean. congestion pricing, another thing we fought for 10 years to pass, that we all benefit uh, EJ communities, but that's not the context that we had. So you know, so we're, when we're not done with that fight, we're gonna go back, but yeah. Um, but by let's the way, it is, it is the most uh, aggressive climate action bill in the United States. We just gotta insert a little more climate justice in there. Let me get one more call on this. Um, from the New Jersey side, we're almost out of time, but June in Jersey City has a story, I think. June, hi, you're on WNYC. Can you do it in about half a minute? Okay, uh, Jersey City has a proposal uh, which the city planning board rejected, and they have several buildings, about 10 buildings, that will now spread over maybe uh, eight blocks or so, that will now uh, accommodate about 15,000 people. Now we're dealing with the water, sewage, and problems, the flood prone areas, the schools, parks. There, there's, no, they have, there's no infrastructure for schools or parks or there's, uh, and on top of that, the, the path, the path, the crowding, it, it's so crowded now. So uh, the city wants to just go and pass it with all these developers and not look at a big overlay study of how our, how this planning could be 
more sustainable and fiscally responsible for our community. June, thank you so much. And so, Nicole, you'll get the last word in this segment. And it strikes me how if when we talk about climate change, uh, people might come in assuming, oh, this is going to be about coal and oil and meat production. Um, and people are also talking about housing so much. Yeah. It's, it's a big deal. Um, first, I want to say that, um, um, you know, legislation and implementation are two different things. Um, just because legislation exists doesn't mean it's being implemented appropriately. Um, you look at city master plans or zoning plans and um, industries as, as a cost of doing business, they're, they're planning on paying money to get variances, which means that they're able to um, plan and cite things in a particular neighborhood or area that it was not intended for or that the community didn't agree was the type of zone for it. So it's supposed to be commercial, residential, but some kind of way somebody knows somebody, I'm pretty sure a check got passed, and then eventually the person finds that they get a variance and they're able to cite the thing. They settle with the community, giving them some little you know, penny candy and a nice little mural or park or something next to a switching station so you can do your research on that. And then see if uh, people are content with that and people are so overextended just trying to get from Monday to Tuesday that they don't have the capacity to be engaged in these long-term battles, and, and so they th count on that. And mm -hmm. so the fight for environmental justice goes on in the context of the fight for equity overall. We thank Nicole Scott Harris, organizer for New Jer the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, and Eddie Batista, executive director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Thank you both so much. Thank you.